where intensity will come about in my life. Intensity. The question of Lauliam Lala Shamai as intensity is called in the in the prayers in the writings of the Goswamis intense eagerness you see when this will come about people are intensely eager to get a lot of money sometimes a man is intensely eager to meet a certain woman and conquer her love the living con living beings are intensely eager for being recognized to have some prestige some position there's so many intense eagerness in this material world we become intensely eager for health when we are afflicted by some disease when we see our lost position in the bed we cannot move everything pains then we become intensely eager for health but when we have a general comment by a medic practitioner that we should cut on our oil and our white sugars that it will not be very good for our health we don't become intensely eager to cut out with those things because we don't feel the need intensity and eagerness this is something very peculiar it's like that you never pay for air you never talk much about air but if some powerful person comes and covers your most mouth and nose and you are deprived of air within seconds air becomes the supreme commodity and you're ready to give up your car your house or anything just for a breath of air amazing no <laughs> it's according to the need it's according to the awareness of our need because we are always in need for protection but we are not very aware of that need we think we are quite safe we think we have the thing under our control i got my money here i got my pistol here I got my uh, bodyguards behind. I got my uh, car is also a secure, bulletproof car. So I'm safe. What shall I worry about? You forget that death can come through a mosquito. Hmm? You forget all your false ideas of security. <coughs> it is nothing but illusion. A major illusion and major illusion keeps us in confusion and thus we go the wrong path instead of the right one in this way we're wasting our human form of life very painfully and very stupid stupidly <coughs> wasting our human form of life by not recognize the reality reality we need shelter we need guidance we need the appropriate action and we need to go against the inappropriate action we need the proper thinking and we have to stop the wrong thinking we have to do the proper talking and stop the nonsense talking but you have to be eager for that to apply it to put your energy and applying it just a primo
please go again and bring me the new book of Srila Srila Maharaj. And the book of Arjuna also and the plan, the, the Parikrama plan as well. So intense eagerness. This is really a, a crucial question. In how much are we eager to live the truth, to practice the truth? How eager are we to help others? How eager are we to please our Guru Maharaj? Careful, there's a monkey right behind you. A small one. <laughs> curious little, curious little fellow. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> we had the good fortune this morning to see the latest publication of Srila Bhakti Rakak Srila Maharaj, Encounters with Divinity, the Path of Dedication. He is the emblem of eagerness, the emblem of spiritual seriousness. Sridhar Maharaj uh, is conveying in his teachings the absolute greatest need in human life to become a pure devotee now. He doesn't allow any delays. At least his teachings don't. And his mood, which we could learn in his ashram, was also like that. Intense. Intense preaching mood. Even though, you know, when we met Srila Srila March, he was in quite an age, no? Practically he was... <coughs> I first met him He was 80, 88 or so. Left the world was nine, 95. So in those days he wasn't just moving as fast as a young guy. And, but his, his preaching was very clear. What he wanted was uh, to help everybody in the world. I remember once the devotees came to Srila Srila March in the months of December. Some devotees just showed up in his, in his mat to have his association. And he asked them, what are you doing here? And they said, well, we came to get your association. He said, what? In the months of December? That's the months of the Christmas marathon. This is the time to, to really do very heavy efforts to increase your temple's economy and all that, you know. It's the best moment to, to go out if you want to do certain uh, preaching things, you know. And they were very surprised. They didn't expect that comment from him. An old Beng Bengali sadhu uh, in his room in Samadhi and thinking about Christmas marathons to be done in the West. <laughs> but Srila Srinamaj was uh, an incredible general of the preaching. Him giving sannyas to everybody, you know. When he gave somebody sannyas, he said, here's your danda and there's the door. <laughs> yes. That was sannyas. Here's your danda and there's the door. Now you find out what you're going to do there. Out there for Krishna. Don't take sannyas and think, now where's my Mahaprasadam plate? It's time for me to have a nice, simple life. No. He was a general. And he told us, go and do this, and go and do that, and go this. 
very energetic actually. Even though he was simultaneously a very philosophical, a very poetic, a back-pushing person in his own way of being. He wasn't eager that, oh, I want to be in the forefront, I want to be recognized, I want to be... No, not at all. He would always do support work. Even for him to accept disciples, that only happened because Nityananda Prabhu personally told him, hey, what are you doing? Once he went to Eka Chakra, the birthplace of Lord Nityananda, and he prayed, my dear Lord Nityananda, give me mercy, give me mercy. And then in the dream, Lord Nityananda appeared to him, he says, why you ask me for mercy? You aren't giving it to anybody. With that, call upon himself by Sri Nityananda Prabhu, he said, oh God. I guess I have to also take more care for others, that they can advance in spiritual life. So, this was basically the revolutionary uh, thing to happen, so that he started accepting disciples. So back pushing and forward going. How do you do that simultaneously? Well, just see how Srila Sridhar did it. Here another book is coming out. Well, why this book is coming out? Because he's pushing. He's pushing from behind the scene. Go, get the record straight. Once Srila Puri Maharaj told me, he said, he pulled me over in his room, he says, we have to protect the Gaudiya Siddhanta. We have to preach against misconceptions. That is uh, an order, this is coming from our spiritual masters, that we should be very clear and very straight in what we are doing in our spiritual life should be should follow the previous acharya strictly that is the whole idea Lord Chaitanya has been very merciful with us he has given us so much has given us so much material to to study to develop our intense eagerness. To Srila Sridhar Maharaj opened himself several temples. He opened the Kurukshetra, Radha Krishna Milan Mandir. He opened the uh, Bombay Godiamat. He opened the Madras Godiamat, which was one of the major construction projects of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He wrote, he edited books. He, uh, he was always involved in, in the uh, traveling program of his Guru Deva. And later he opened the Chaitanya Saraswat Mat, he opened the Calcutta Mat, he opened the Jagannath Puri Mat. He opened the, well, his disciples opened the Hapanya Mat. Uh, and then he was opening temples all over the world and inspiring others who were doing some preaching around the world. So, Srila Srila Maharaj, in his own way, is one of the great generals of pushing the pure preaching of Lord Chaitanya. And that is to become intensely eager. Actually, also one of the intense eagerness, which are appropriate, is the intense eagerness to help others. The intense eagerness to have a temple. The intense <coughs> eagerness of delivering, of the message of your Guru Dev. The intense eagerness to give shelter to others. The intense eagerness to guide the people in their spiritual life if they want any guidance from you. It's, it's quite a task. And the Brahmacharis you have to guide in one way, the Grihastas you guide in another way, the Vishnu Priya Ashrams you guide in another way, the Sannyasis you guide in another one. Each one of them have so many tasks to learn. And the month of Kartik here is to come to increase our eagerness. And this eagerness, that eagerness is protected by the third part of this Niyama Seva, or the third Yama, 
and this we will read right now from this book. It's called Nishtabhajan, the fixation of the mind to the object of worship, Sri Krishna. Vinatapi sunichena tarot ipa sahishluna amanina manadena kirtaniya sadahari. The person entitled to do Nam Sankita, the procedure of doing Harinam, is asserted in the third verse of Shikshastakam. The aspirant who is more humble than a blade of grass, more forbearing than a tree, who is completely <coughs> devoid of desire for getting respect from others, but giving due respect to all, is eligible for doing Harikirtana always. Jerupalilinamaprema Shukanya mailea kare panina magaya je je magaya tare teya apanadana garma vrishte sahe anela kara ye lakshana utamahanya vaishnava habeni rabbimana jiva samana divejani krishna adhistana Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu addressing Swarup Damoda and Rai Ramananda has said, Hear about the scriptural verse expressing the characteristics of how to do Harinam by which pure devotional love can be manifested in spite of being endowed with good qualities. One who considers himself more abominable than a blade of grass who has got the quality of forbearance in two ways. Like the tree, instead of being looped, does not say anything but tolerates and has no aptitude to give trouble to anyone for its own sake for getting water, for sacrificing its own interests to fulfill the desire of others who seek its help, True Vaishnavas are endowed with such good qualities. They see their object of worship, Sri Krishna, in all living beings and res give respect to all. So this Shikshastakam is really our guiding principle for community life. One of my major activities in this world is community building. The building of community means to learn how to live together and do something for Krishna. Because each and every one for himself, he can't get too much done. If you want your children to be educated in Krishna conscious, you have to provide them in a Krishna conscious environment. If the children are entirely associated with non-devotional surrounding, they will most likely become non-devotional as well. So you want to educate the children, you have to form community. Community means a great amount of sacrifice. To do something, to, tr to try something, to create a devotional environment. So community building in one way or other in my life has been uh, a part of, an, of the agenda. And I must tell you, it's very complicated. Specifically because of the egos. The egos are sometimes mountains, they seem to be much higher than the Himalayas. The egos are so difficult to conquer and the egos make it that people for minor issues, I mean for insignificant minor issues can throw away entire commitments, relationships. I mean the ego is such a nasty element in our existence that it is really challenging our overall benefit and well-being. So because of that ego trip, we are all struggling and suffering to get anything accomplished. When I talk about community building, I'm talking about ashrams and congregations around ashrams. 
because only to get married and have children, this is also community making in a small size. But it's also tough. Because just to get just to get along with some person, just to be able to adjust to another person continuously, that is quite a task. So in all eagerness, I've always come back to square one. Trinata Pisunichina, Tarona Pisahishnuna. Amani Namanani na kirtani atsadani. Only with real humility you can form community. And what is the quality of, co of humility? Well, Mahaprabhu doesn't say, please be humble. No! He says, consider yourself more insignificant than a blade of grass in the street. Just an insignificant grass, like this leaf there. Who cares about this leaf? Of course, this is a pipa leaf, so it's sacred. And many people take pipa leaves and paint Krishna on it and keep it. So, so let's talk about something else, which is really insignificant. Like this little piece of the flower. Of course, this is a flower which offered, so it is sacred. Even when the garbage which comes from the altar or from anything offered, that is called maha garbage. So it is very important. It should not be discarded unconsciously uh, even that at least it should be composted very nicely to produce some very healthy uh, fertilizer for our plants but you know insignificant I'm talking something so insignificant that it has no use for anything then you think I should consider myself less valuable than that then you get a a clue what Mahaprabhu is talking about. He says more forbearing than a tree. Well, a, a tree is even given shade to a person who takes a saw and starts cutting one of his, his, his branches. Still, he's giving shade to him. Still, he's serving him. A tree is so forbearing. It is amazing and delivering fruits and flowers continuously to anybody and everybody without any discrimination. A tree has such incredible qualities, tolerant, and this is what Mahaprabhu says we should be. We should be tolerant and giving. You see, even though the others may not deserve it that much, but even if you give, then they will be benefited and there will Make spiritual advance. Shall I only serve those devotees who are highly qualified? Well, actually, they don't need my service. <coughs> I should serve those who have no qualities, who need me, who are in trouble. I should be there for them, with them. Then it makes sense, right? So, service means the tree is giving service to the offender and he just goes on. Even though the offender may come and want to take from the tree, the tree still keeps giving, keeps giving. <sighs> Can I do that ever? Will I ever reach such a consciousness of giving unconditionally? Oh. So Mahaprabhu is putting a high goal for community building. Hmm? It's not cheap. But then he goes even further. He says, when I have no desire to be respected whatsoever, there's no wish within me that I'll be uh, given some recognition or some, some special consideration. Ah, then I will be in a good shape. Hmm? No, not at all. When you have no desire of any respect given to you, but simultaneously you are ready to offer respect to all souls, brothers, sisters, animals, plants. You re offer respect to all. You see God in them some or other. That is such an extraordinary, auspicious point of view. 
such a wonderful standpoint. <coughs> what does it do? What does that do to you? Well, it keeps you in Krishna consciousness. Then you can go on every day. You say, oh yes, oh yes, of course. Why not? Thank you very much. Happily I do it. What else is to be done? Don't ask for service to be brought to you. Find your service. Make sure you're engaged. Other people will engage you if you do nothing. Some merciful devotee will come and says, Prabhu, come here. Come on, you have to do something. You've got to participate a bit in something. And you go, oh yeah, okay, okay, I'll do that. Huh? That's not really the spirit of bhakti, you know. In community living, you know, you have to share the responsibility. The first thing in community living you have to do is to ask, what am I supposed to do? Where's my way? What can I do to grow? How will I get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya? Where do you need me, dear devotees, members of the community? Where do you need me? I'm here to serve. I'm here to help. So please be so kind and do not reject me. Give me some service. And how much service? Oh, there's no limit to it. As much as you have time to do service. And when you do your service, you can do your service slowly, you can do it quickly. That, that depends on your eagerness to serve. If you're eager to serve, you do your service efficiently and quickly. If you're not eager to serve, you just try to make excuses. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'll do it later. Don't bother me. It's spontaneous. And you give all kinds of pretexts why, why things are delaying. Because you are not really into it. Because you're not eager. And of course, that's for community building is not so good. Because if everybody's a lazy bum, you know, the whole thing goes down the drain. I mean, just like our cooks. The cook, he cannot delay. He has to be on time. If his job is the prasama has to be ready at one, prasama has to be ready at one. If he delays 15 minutes, everybody looks at him with raised eyebrow. If he delays one hour, everybody starts swearing. If he delays two hours, everybody wants to jump at his throat. So, so you see, a, a humble cook, he has to be so punctual and so dedicated. And then I tell him, hey Prabhu, today we have 20 guests. And he says, okay, thanks for telling me. Then he has to cook for 20 people more. He has to put much more energy. That is surrender, right? But you say, 20 more, forget it. I'm not cooking anymore. Hmm? <coughs> so you see, responsibility, prescribed duties, how to go about them, how eager you are, how good you will do them. This type of community building, oh my God. Everybody says, Better to become a hermit, better to sit somewhere in a cave and just tolerate the, the, the external the sufferings. And mm, I prefer to be alone with my false ego than to go and serve others and to try to struggle against my shortcomings. Hmm? But unfortunately, or fortunately, you won't last in that cave very long. We are very social beings. We are, we are to form community. We are to form ashrams. We are to form all these things. They are natural. We can't just live by ourselves. If somebody tries it, then it's usually artificial. And then even if he lives there, he has to, I mean, to be a real hermit, to live on roots, and drink only some water from the river flowing by, if you're lucky to have a river, if you're not in the Sinai, somewhere in the desert. I mean, saintly persons, renunciation. Prabhupada said, that means go out and preach. Go out and give to others what I've given to you. Then you are renunciate. <coughs> then you are serious about it. Otherwise, just a joke. Huh? It's like you're sitting somewhere, you say, yes, yes, I'm a very renounced person. Can you please bring me a gulab jamam? Huh? 
uh, I'm, I'm a renounced person, can you please uh, wash my clothes? Uh, like that? No, sir. That's, that's not the idea. You have to be in, absorbed so much in service day and night that uh, maybe, maybe somebody will come forward to help you in your work and then you feel shy and guilty about it. Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot serve me. I cannot allow that. Of course, there's a degree of love which is above that, no? Sometimes, like for example, a disciple cooks for the spiritual master or arranges the room or organizes a preaching program because he knows that's not for him. That's for his service to his guru, for Krishna. There is a level. But still, anybody who demands to be served, anybody who demands to be attended, that's totally nonsense. That's not spiritual life. Community living, uh, community building is really on the basis of humility. And Mahaprabhu is not sparing any effort to make clear what that means. No? A, real, a real community, a real, a real help for the others. Now we will go on, uh, because after we got ourselves a little bit drilled, means our mind is being put into shape with instructions of the Shikshastakam. Now comes our meditation on Lord Krishna's sweet pastimes of today, the forenoon pastimes of Radha Krishna. The blessed votary should think about it while doing Harinam. Purva nidenu mitrair vipinam anushritam goshta lokanuyanam krishnam radapti lolam tat abhistri krite prapta tat kundatiram Radam Chalokya Krishnam Krita Griha Kamanam Aryayar Karchana Yai Dishtam Krishna Pravrityai Prahita Nija Shaki Vatmanitram Smarami This is Shloka from Govinda Lilamrita. When Krishna with calves and coward boys goes to forest, Nanda Maharaj Yashoda Devi and other milkman and milkwoman of Prajadam are following Krishna as long as they can see him. They're going, but when they cannot see him, they return disappointed. Krishna delights the calves and coward boys by attra but attracted by pure devotion of Radharani, goes to Radhakunda to meet Radharani who has been anxiously waiting at Radha Kunda to see Krishna and to get his company. Krishna, of course, consoled the calves or cows and coward boys before going to Radha Kunda at noon. I remember the lotus feet of Sri Krishna in the four noon pastimes. Radharani is always anxious to meet Sri Krishna and she took advice of Krishna how she should come and meet him because mother-in-law Jatila would not allow her to come. Krishna has advised Radharani, you should not say you are going coming to see me, then you will not get the per permission. Household persons are more inclined to worship demigods to get worldly benefits. You should pray to your mother-in-law that you want to worship the sun. the sun god, then your mother-in-law will immediately approve it and allow you to worship sun god for getting mundane benefits. Under the pretext of worshipping sun god, you will be able to meet me. Radharani with great perturbation of heart has sent one confident to search for Sri Krishna and how she can go to the particular place where Krishna is residing and she can meet Krishna. Radharani is very anxiously awaiting for the return of the confidant to get the information where to go to see Krishna. I remember the lotus feet of such Radharani in the forenoon pastimes. So the next days we will go to that place where this took actually place called 
Suryakunda. There, Radharani worshipped the sun. She was coming from Javat and she had a rendezvous with Krishna. But Jatila was very anxious that she should not do anything beyond her control. But it is said when you worship the sun god, lots of gold will come to your house. So Radharani said, Mother, I want to worship Surya so we will have more opulence in our home. If you give your blessings, I will certainly do that service for our family. Then Jatila said, Oh, more gold will come to our house. That's a very good idea. Please go quickly, make it on time to see the Surya uh, Narayan and to worship him. And then Sometimes she also sent an investigator because she said Radharani, she heard some gossip. Radharani is not worshipping sun god. She is going to meet Krishna. What? I will not allow this again. I will send the spy. So she sent the spy to go to Surya Kun. And then Lord Krishna who knows everything. When the spy just comes, he turns into Surya the line. And Radharani is doing seva and the spy says, oh, it is true. She's worshipping the sun god. <coughs> so he goes back to Jatila and says, I don't see anything wrong. I saw her with my own eyes worshipping the, the Lord Surya. But actually Surya Narayan is Krishna. It's just one of his tricky forms. Huh? So Krishna he can change his form in any way he wishes to, to enhance and sweeten his pastimes. So uh, definitely some of my friends, they have recently reconstructed the Surya Narayan temple at the Surya Kunja. It's a very long road there. Do you know, sometimes you wonder how Radha and Krishna moved such far distances so fast from one moment to the other. And one of the Acharyas has said, according to Krishna's will, the, the dam extracts itself or it recoils itself according to Krishna's sweet will of moving around. So in this way, uh, they have harmonized this. Uh, the capacity of Krishna is, of course, anyhow beyond our com uh, comprehension. But fact is... Surya Kunda is a very special place and when you see the Surya Narayan deity it's very charming and Radharani goes there and she cooks for Krishna and she meets him in Radha Kunda and then I mean they're meeting all day you know meeting here and sometimes if they cannot meet then uh, they feel immediately very sad because this is eagerness intense eagerness to meet your beloved that is the divine love which we are so anxious to achieve. And for that we have to go the hard path of service in separation and giving up the feverish condition of material sense gratification, which is just a very poisonous and very painful attempt of substituting divine love with such a thing like some mundane relationship or anything like that because it simply will not be able to suit the needs of your soul. Even though you may not wish to embrace that full realization out of some hope for fleshy uh, uh, sensations, but it has already been confirmed a number of times that it is always turning out the same, some disillusion in the relationships of the, of the kernel world where there's nothing but lust instead of love and therefore obviously it cannot respond to the need of your, the craving of your soul. Anyhow, these are just a few observations we are making today on this topic. Then again I have another great pleasure to present to you the doorway to eternity. Now you have come to the doorway of eternity called Brindavan. This wonderful book composed by our dear friend Arjuna. 
together with his his photographer friend is an insight a view into Vindavan beautiful pictures of Vindavan which will always remind us you know some people say I've lost my heart in Vindavan boy are they lucky you know because usually you lose your heart somewhere else and that that ain't too good huh? I mean you can lose your heart at the feet of the Takurji, you can lose your heart with the Vaishnavas, you can lose your heart in Vindavan, but don't lose your heart somewhere else because it's lost. And then you have to go pick it up again and see how it was mistreated. So, so but the doorway to eternity, it came out, this very, very nice meditation on Vindavan in chosen black and white pictures. They purposefully did not take color picture because they wanted to catch the spirit of it rather than becoming enamored with the form. Of course, the form is also something special. Anyhow, this is the artistic preference which they have taken, and I personally think they had a very good success of conveying. Really what Arjuna is trying to do, he's trying to bring everybody's love to Vindavan. That is really his purpose of making this book. Knowing him personally, I know he doesn't have any other concern. And I think he was able to produce a masterpiece. So, congratulations for him in absence. He's not here to listen to our commentary. So, neither did he do it for getting commentaries. But the fact is, Vindavan has another masterpiece of showing to the world this rea this reality. You see Kunti still? She in the area? Kopini? You know her? She always come, comes here. Or came here, I don't know if she's now coming. Okay. These books are available in Rinda Bookstore. Please don't go home without your copy. This is the type of a book. You give this book as a gift, you know. You give something tangible. And you can give it to somebody who is not yet a devotee as well. Because it'll, it's like an introduction book in a very special way. Because you see a reality of Vrindavan which only really the pilgrim sees. Only when you come here and do Parikrama, you see those things, no? And only, uh, and since it voids you the rickshaws and some of the difficult things to see here, like sometimes it looks like the Dham is hiding behind some, uh, some external things which make you want to run away, you know? Uh, but the, there you see that that dam through the eye of a devotee. And this is very, this is a very great uh, gift. I'm very happy to see this book. So here we are going.